Thanks for inviting me to give this talk. Um, hopefully I'll give you some insights into ECHO and the role in LA appendage occlusion. These are my disclosures. So what I'm going to just talk through is initially just give you some key concepts on the echo anatomy. So you've, you've had a beautiful talk on the, um, the gross anatomy just now, so hopefully I'm going to reinforce some of these issues. Then we're going to talk through a systematic approach using trans esophageal echo. And then we're going to talk about some highlights during the procedure itself. And then finally, just a little bit on follow-up imaging and what you might want to look for. So to begin with, the left atrial appendage, as you've heard, is actually made of up of several um, parts. Now, what I've got at the top here are some images at 45 degrees, and on the whole, you can see the appendage looks very much windsock-like. But what we see is that as you rotate through the degrees and look at the higher degrees and look more anteriorly in the heart, you see that the LA appendage can assume quite different shapes. So you have the windsock at the bottom on the left here, you have chicken wing, and you have cauliflower. There's a fourth described called cactus, but actually on echo, so the cactus has actually been identified more on using CT imaging. So on echo, I think these three types of shape really broadly um, explain and show the types of anatomy we might, might see. Now, the importance of understanding this and realizing that actually, as you go to the higher degrees, is there are, there are potentially multiple lobes of the left atrial appendage. And in fact, to access usually the longest lobe, as you're hearing, is the important part, you need to really look more anteriorly and at the higher degrees to the 135 views and beyond. And that's what really I wanted to highlight in the key anatomy when it comes to echo. The other thing to think about is the LA morphology is really described in terms of the ostium or orifice. Also, the, neck, the landing zone, so that's at the level of the um, circumflex vessel usually here. But in fact, what we're describing here is where the trabeculations usually start. So you have a smooth part here, which is described as the neck. So you've got the ostium, the neck, and then you have the landing zone where the true trabeculations of the appendage start. Now, con conceptually, this is important to understand when it comes to the different types of devices we use. So if we now look at where those landmarks might be in the middle appendage, you see that there is the orifice. This is the landing zone, and you can see there's very little neck. When it comes to the right image, you see that that's where the ostium or the orifice lies. This is roughly where the true trabeculations begin, and this is where the circumflex vessel is, so this is the landing zone. And then you can see the neck is much longer in this case. So these are the kind of things we're thinking about when we're wondering what kind of device and where to place the device. So just to talk through the key landmarks on ECHO, we've already seen some beautiful images, but I just wanted to demonstrate. So these are CT images. So this here is the sternum. So this is an on, uh, a direct view, a, a chest X-ray type AP view. And you can see that the left heart border is made up in the middle by the left atrial appendage usually. So the, if you now rotate the image to its profile, you see here the LA appendage. And in the majority of cases, the LA appendage pokes round and sits in front of the pulmi artery, which is the pulmi artery here, as you can see there. So the important thing here is to realize that with a lariat um, closure, you may not be able to close a, uh, an appendage that doesn't sit anteriorly in this way. But the other key landmarks here when it comes to the echo imaging is, first of all, the pulmi vein. So these are the left upper the one that's highlighted here. And what you notice is there's a fold of tissue. You've already heard about the ridge. I call it the warfarin ridge, but it's also known as the coumadin ridge, that separates the uh, um, pulmi vein from the left atrial appendage. The other key landmark here is a circumflex vessel, as, and as, as you've seen, it sits around the base of the appendage, away from the orifice usually, um, and as it is at the base of the neck where the true trabeculations start. And then you have the pulmi artery, which sits anteriorly, and that's an important and useful landmark for when it comes to deployment of the devices. So if we just take a closer look into the 3D anatomy of the heart, so now we're inside the heart, and if I just turn your attention to the top image here on the, on the right, what you see here is, so this is the surgical view of the mitral valve, and you see here the aortic valve, and this here is the left main stem, the distal left main stem dividing, and this vessel running around the, the AV groove is a circumflex artery, and you can see its relationship 
to the um, appendage. And this is right at the base, as I said, where the trabeculation start. Now, the other thing I wanted to draw your attention to is this image here on the right. And what we see here is that this is where the um, warfarin ridge sits. So there's the appendage. This is the left upper pulmonary vein. In the distance down below is your mitral valve and the annulus you can see. But the key thing here is this tissue, this fold of tissue that separates the left upper pulmonary vein from the LA appendage, it actually forms this, this is a warfarin ridge. And if you follow the orifice round, you see that the superior aspect of the orifice of the LA appendage is actually in a different plane to the inferior orifice um, edge here. So it's almost like a spiraling down to the point where the trabeculation start. So it's just um, important to understand that when you come to your echo imaging. And the lastly, the, as you've already heard, the um, interatrial septum, which is here, you can see its relationship to the LA appendage. Now above will be your um, left pulmonary veins and the warfarin ridge. And so the key is to ensure that you have the right angle. And usually you'll find that in the inferior posterior part of the fossa ovalis is the best position to place catheters to angle such that you enter the orifice correctly. Okay, so a systematic approach is key because that way you don't miss anything and then you understand all of this anatomy as I've described. So starting at zero degrees, what we see here is so aortic valve, circumflex and cross-section, so aortic valve, circumflex and cross-section. You cross across, cut across the appendage at the orifice level here and then you begin to see a part of the Wharton ridge and above is the pulmonary vein and usually the left upper. So then at 45 degrees, so remember that as you're scanning through your systematic approach, it's a continuous sweep. It's not just one view and then don't look at the appendage and then move to the next view and then don't look at the appendage. You'll miss information that way. It's a 3D structure. Remember, there are usually more than one lobe, often two or three on average. And so it's important not to miss the detail. You remember you're screening for all sorts of things, including um, thrombus formation. So that's why it's important to remember it's a 3D structure. You're using 2D cut planes to, sc to scroll through, so you must um, think in those terms. So now at 45 degrees, so I'm giving you four specific views to look at, and the reason for that is that that's where we do our standard measurements. So 45 degrees, again, similarly you have the circumflex and cross-section, aortic valve is beginning to disappear now, and you have your warfarin ridge nicely seen and the left upper pulmonary vein. And then at 90 degrees, you then begin to see the ridge in long axis. You see the pulmonary vein lengthening and opening, and part of the mitral valve then begins to come into view. And then the final view, which is key um, as well when it comes to deployment, is your 135 view, and this is now where you're looking more anteriorly, and this is often where you see the most uh, anterior and usually the longest lobe of the appendage. And you see that, that you see the circumflex now in long axis opened up. You see the um, pulmonary vein above and the long warfarin ridge now you're transecting it, and now you see the um, pulmonary artery, and this tells you that this is anterior, this is um, uh, posterior, okay? Okay, so specifics about sizing when it comes to echo. So I, I've got an image playing on the right, that's the 3D uh, data set, and that's what we use to size the appendage. There are all sorts of considerations when it comes to filling of the patient, making sure that you have the right size appendage when you're measuring it and the patient isn't dehydrated. But those things aside, when it comes to the measurements, conceptually, there are two types of devices, the major devices that we use and how we think about it. So I've already mentioned, if we turn our attention to ACP and amulet, what, what we look at are those three measurements. So we've got the orifice, uh, you have the landing zone, which is where the two trabeculations start, at the level of the circumflex, and then you want to know the depth, and in other words, the clearance, which should be a minimum of 10 millimeters for the lobe. So the Ideal is to place the lobe at this level and to have the disc sitting here, closing the top of the, uh, the mouth of the orifice. With the watchman, now we ignore the orifice, but we look at the level of the circumflex and where the true trabeculations start. So we come into trouble sometimes when we realize that actually trabeculations, as we've seen on our anatomical images can extend further up. So then a decision needs to be made as to where you place your device accordingly. But usually we want to place it at the circumflex level and for both devices, the key is the circumflex level where the trabeculations are, the hooks engage at this level. 
and that reduces your risk of embolization and dis dislodgement of the device. So that's why I've mentioned that as a landing zone. Now, for the watchman, you want to ensure that the landing zone width, which determines the size of the watchman device you use, is at least equal to or la um, the, the, the length of the lobe, sorry, is equal to or um, longer than the landing zone because that means that you have enough space to unsheath your device and place it. So there are conceptually the key things about the sizing. Now when it comes to the measurements, you can see here we use our 3D, so we notice, and as the data suggests, that the orifice is not usually orifice, it's, uh, it's not usually round, it's usually oval. Now, in that setting, when it comes to your watchman device, you'll use your 2D, or you can use your 3D, or even CT, but you usually go for the largest diameter, and that's usually based along any point in the cardiac cycle where the orifice, um, where the landing zone looks the biggest. So there's no set way of measuring it except where it looks the largest. So for a watchman, you use the largest measurement. But for ACP and amulet, we tend to use an average of the, as you can see here in that measurement that I had here, you'll tend to use the, the um, orthogonal planes where you see the shortest and the widest and take an average of the two. So that's just an important concept to think about as well. And I just mentioned that the, the appendage is too large and you've got the upper measurements here. Um, the ranges, then watchman, then um, lariat is something to consider. Okay, so some highlights about the procedure itself. So this is really important. When it comes to left atrial appendage thrombus, there's a lot of confusion sometimes. So the key here is to, um, first of all, remember that you have a thick warfarin ridge in the way, and that often creates reverberation artifacts. So this is what we're seeing here. So if you drop M mode, uh, along here, and sometimes using colour, it helps you realise that actually that um, reverberation artefact is exactly what it is because you see the same image mirrored below it um, in, in the same line as the um, uh, Warfarin Ridge. So that's the first thing to think about. If you're still unsure, then drop the scale. So I brought the scale down to 30, and you'll actually see this flow throughout, and it goes over what we think is um, an artifact, so that's fine. But if you have this kind of appearance and you're still not sure what you're looking at, is this truly thrombus or is this just sludge and will it just clear, then uh, echo contrast, so Sonoview is what we use in the UK, um, and there are others like uh, Definity and others that you can use. But to remember that if you're going to use echo contrast, give it time. Give enough and give it time because there's slow flow within the left atrium. So you need to give it time for the LA appendage to fully fill. And remember, you look through every view as I've described uh, and make sure that all of this is filled. And if it all fills fully and there's no filling defects, then that isn't thrombus. Okay, so a couple of other things about the procedure. Um, the first is the transeptal puncture. So the aim is to ensure, as I've already described, is to try and go inferior posterior to get the right angle of the LA appendage. So on the cartoon image here, this is the quadrant we want to be in, the inferior posterior part. So on echo, what that means is, so I've got X-plane, I've got some 3D imaging here. This is um, one type of 3D imaging called X-plane where you can um, look at one view. So this is a live image in 45 degrees. And this is, we've rotated the image now to look at an orthogonal view at 90 degrees. And what we're looking for is to have the aortic um, root or the aortic valve here. And that cut in this plane means that this is anterior, this is posterior. So we want to be in the mid to posterior part of the septum. Now in the 90 degree view, roughly 90, anywhere between 90 and 110 usually, you want to see the SVC, so that tells you that's superior. And sometimes the IVC comes into view, not always in this view, but you know this is inferior. So again, you want to be mid to, uh, to inferior. So you can actually guide the operator to this position and hopefully be able to angle and create a puncture in the inferior posterior septum to aid your procedure. During the procedure itself, when it comes to deployment, it's worth remembering that, as I've said, the longest lobe sits, tends to sit anteriorly, so that's the 135 view. So here you see the appendage. So this is the 45, and this is the 135 view here. And what you notice is that typically this view gives you the proximal part of the appendage, so that equates to your areo um, cranial view. And typically the 135 view gives you the length and the most anterior part of the appendage, 
and the longest lobe usually, and that's the um, that's the equivalent of the areocaudal view. So that's why it's nice to be able to work simultaneously in these views for the, for the operator to see that. And that helps you guide the sheath. So you can see the sheath coming in here, but actually the angle then can be um, uh, looked at and assessed and changed if necessary when you see what it looks like here. And when we started, the sheath was sitting pointing this way, and then the operator was able to reposition to ensure we'd access the anterior and longest lobe by moving the sheath. So that's why these two views are essential during the procedure itself. And so lastly, as part of the, uh, the procedure itself, once you've deployed the device, the checks are key. So there's the pass criteria for the watchman device. So what you're looking at is the position. You want to ensure most of the device is sitting, just close, is, sh um, is sitting at the level of the circumflex and rather below it. Um, you want to ensure there isn't a large shoulder because remember that the covering of the device it only comes down to um, uh, about two-thirds of the length. So you want to make sure that no more than a third of the shoulder is poking out, dependent on the length or the size of the device. So you will measure that shoulder if necessary. You want to ensure the anchorage is correct. So the tug test, you want to make sure the device returns to its position without moving. When it comes to sizing, you want to ensure you have the central pin of the device visible, so you're transecting right in the middle of the device, and then you look to make sure there's a degree of compression. So minimum of 8%, the company will say, but usually around 20 to 30% compression compared to the actual size of the device, so that's what you're looking for. And then lastly, the seal, you may need to bring the scale down just to ensure you don't have any large um, flow around the device itself. And of course, 3D is key here, and I've got a couple of images to show you later. When it comes to the amulet device, what, what the key things here are then to ensure that you align nicely with the length of the appendage, so the lobe is sitting two-thirds below the level of the circumflex, that it's well compressed, so it has this nice tire shape, as you can see here that the disc is concave and that there is a degree of separation between the disc and the lobe and that tells you that the, the device is well compressed and under tension and so should be well anchored. And so lastly, when it comes to the follow-up with these devices, the key to remember is the follow-up will determine your uh, medical anticoagulation, antiplatelet regime. That's why you're doing it. So. Normally, it's done around six weeks, so this is according to our randomized trial data, so that's where it's based on. And what you want to look for is that the device is sitting where you left it, that there's begin the beginnings of endothelialization. In fact, I'm giving you an example here of six months just to show you what endothelialization looks like. You want to ensure there are no leaks and that the device is sitting correctly, and that's where, as, you, as this image plays on the left, you'll see the 3D, I think, is really um, so useful that I... I don't think I can really assess these devices without it now that I have it. But when it comes to issues, so the things you're looking for specifically are device position and residual flow. So here you can see this is the device at the time of deployment, and then this is the device, uh, this is only six weeks later, and you can see that the device is dislodged, dislodged. There it is, time of deployment in 3D, and this is now six weeks later, and you can see that the, the device is dislodged and moved, and there is residual flow. And this, there we measure the degree of flow when the risk increases, again, according to our ra randomized control data that suggests that five millimeters or more is um, at risk of uh, significant thrombus formation, although I have to say it's more of a theoretical risk. But Thrombus is another thing we look for, and here you can see on a watchman device. So these images are from Dr. Fran, who's in the audience. So thank you, John, for these images. And you can see here that the device, the watchman device here, has this um, echolucent, similar to myocardial consistency, um, uh, a lesion on there, and that's thrombus. And you can see a still image there. And then other things you look for are residual leaks. So if the flow is significant and the leak is more than five millimeters, that may then inform you to continue anticoagulation for longer. And I'll stop there, and just to emphasize that there are some key aspects, defining anatomy, sizing, transeptal puncture, monitoring complications, and that ECHO really, I think, is a gold standard, during, particularly during the procedure. And a procedure that can look like this, if you don't use ECHO properly and know how to do it, it can go on for a while, it can be quite painful. Um, but of course, if you've got echo imaging and hopefully 3D in your lab, then this is how the procedure looks. <laughs> uh.
and I'll stop there. Thank you.